Mm, so, welcome back to the Winter School Digitizing the Materiality of the Pre-Modern Book. We are in the TI and Digital Editing session today, which I will be doing. Mm, let me just quickly reintroduce myself. Uh, my name is Sarah Lang. I am a postdoc at the Center for Information Modeling, Zentrum für Informationsmodellierung in Graz, where we currently are. And um, I teach on various subjects in the digital humanities, such as uh, digital editions, and my uh, thematic focus is uh, early modern alchemical literature. Yes, yeah, so today we will be learning about digital editions and XML TI, and with a focus obviously on pre modern books and trying to tie it all in with what we have learned in the previous sessions. So, this is uh, what our program is going to be for today. Um, we will quickly go into the theory of data modeling. We will go into the theory of digital scholarly <coughs> editing, um, so just so we can understand the terms involved, because not all of them are self-evident, even though they might seem so. Mm, quickly go over a few editorial schools and workflows. Um, distinguish what is different between a digital edition and data in a digital oh. archive, or a facsimile, oh. or a library catalog. And then we will go into annotating with XML markup. This will be a complete uh, beginner's introduction, so if you already have basic skills in this, it might be a little redundant, but I hope I still have some exercises that will be fun for you or a good reminder. And then we will go into the text encoding initiative where we will be introduced to the text encoding initiative and um, apply what we have learned to it, create a TI header with the data we have created yesterday and uh, also encode a title page and then maybe see where are the differences between the um, classical um, bibliographic description or how can we encode that into the TI and what are the different approaches. And we will learn many more details uh, on MS description in the afternoon session. So we won't go into too much detail now, but I will try to give you um, a good introduction in where this all fits in. So what are the goals for today's session? Um, I want you to understand basic modeling theory for digitization. In the digital humanities, modeling is a very important concept, even so much that some people think that the defining criterion of digital humanities as a discipline is that we all model things, because obviously the digital humanities are a very varied field. Um, I want you to understand the differences between a digital scholarly edition and other digital resources such as archives and library catalog data, to understand the role of XML and TI in digital editing, and then for the practical, be able to use the text encoding initiative standard to encode descriptions of pre-modern books. So yeah, I wrote down the goals again. It's like understanding modeling theory, understanding the terms digital edition, digital archive, and library catalog. What we will not be doing is MS description. That's in the next session and transcriptions and in TI and transcribers. This is gonna be in the Saturday morning session. So just so you know uh, what's gonna happen. So let's start with data modeling. We have basically been talking about data modeling all along, but maybe not explicitly so. That's why I wanted to just bring it to mind how this all fits into modeling theory. And for modeling theory, I always need to begin with Stachowiak. It's a... Uh, um, it's a German language modeling theory. So modeling theory in the English speaking world and the German speaking world isn't necessarily the same. Also the discourses around it in digital humanities because I feel that often um, German modeling theory isn't necessarily um, read so much in the English speaking world. But I just want to let you know the three properties of a model following Stachowiak. Mm, so models have general properties, the first of which is mapping. So in German it says, Modelle sind stets Modelle von etwas, nämlich Abbildungen, Repräsentationen natürlicher oder künstlicher Originale, die selbst wieder Modelle sein können. Der Abbildungsbegriff fällt mit dem Begriff der Zuordnung von Modellattributen zu Originalattributen zusammen. And in English that means, models are always models of something. Seems obvious. But there are mappings from representations of natural or artificial originals that can be models themselves. So, for example, uh, a globe that I can put on my desk 
is a model of the world. And I can make a digital 3D model of the globe on my desk. So that would be a model of a model. The second is the reduction property that becomes obvious quickly if we look at our model of a model or maybe copy of a copy um, idea that we've already talked about yesterday as well. Uh, Stachowiak says that uh, Modelle erfassen im Allgemeinen nicht alle Attribute des durch sie präsentierten Originals, sondern nur solche, die den jeweiligen Modellerschaffern äh, und oder Modellbenutzern relevant erscheinen. So models in general capture not all attributes of the original represented by them, but rather only those seeming relevant to their model creators and or model users. So what does this tell us? The model is something that um, should be used. We create a model so we can use it for a specific purpose, but it also entails that we cannot necessarily use it for a purpose that wasn't intended in the first place. In terms of digitization, what would that mean? For example, if I mass digitize something, I will often be less detailed. So if I have a very specific research question that I didn't plan for initially, I might not be able to answer this research question with the data I created. And so for example, um, essentially a digitized image, as we've seen in the digitization session, is a representation in the digital world of a material object. This is already a model in some way. It is a reduced model, for example, it loses its um, 3D property, it becomes a 2D artifact that is encoded in certain data standards. So this is part of the reduction that's happening. And there's the pragmatism um, property. Eine pragmatisch vollständige Bestimmung des Modellbegriffs hat nicht nur die Frage zu berücksichtigen, wovon etwas Modell ist, Abbildungsmerkmal, sondern auch für wen, wann und wozu bezüglich seiner je spezifischen Funktionen als Modell ist. So models are not uniquely assigned to their originals per se. They fulfill their replacement function for a particular cognitive and or acting model using subjects within particular time intervals and restricted to particular mental or actual operations. This is essentially also the same thing that I just said. I can use my model for what it was designed for. A model only represents a state in time. So I model with my best knowledge and then, for example, this is something that Willard McCarty, uh, an important digital humanities modeling theorist, would have said, uh, I use the model to learn more about the original and then I have to modify my model to uh, include this new knowledge. So a model is only a model at a certain uh, point in time. That's also what Pia Fiedler was telling us. Some of the things that were digitized in the 1990s, that was in this case also the technical limitation of the time. These models used to be good or maybe even the best possible models or images at the time, but they are not appropriate anymore for our standards today. So they only fulfill their modeling function well uh, in a certain period of time. So Stachowiak also says that all knowledge making is knowledge making in or through models and all human perception of the world needs models as a medium. In German he says, alle Erkenntnis ist Erkenntnis in Modellen oder durch Modelle und jede menschliche Weltbegegnung überhaupt bedarf des Mediums Modell. So he says the model is essentially a tool to understand the whole world, but that also means everything that we do in the humanities, and especially in the digital humanities, is modeling in some way. So that's why I think it makes sense for you to know just the very basics of modeling theory. We're not going to go into it much more in detail. But um, for example, uh, the fact that the model is not the original. It seems very obvious, but I know many people in the humanities who, for example, criticize my models because this is not the original. You have missed this one attribute. So I think they have missed modeling theory that by definition, uh, a model is an abstraction. So it will not have all the attributes. I think that's, um, it can be a good thing because then it becomes more general. Because if I cover all the attributes of my particular original, as we've seen, many of the books were very unusual. So this, the standard approach didn't work for all of them but you could think of the standard approach as the model. And we can also, which is also something that Willard McCarty says, we can learn from the models in the places where it diverges from the original or the, where the original doesn't fit into the model. 
that is precisely where models allow us to learn things. So the model is a snippet of the real world, but it only covers the attributes that I chose to be relevant for the task at hand or for myself. Thus, the model and the aspect of the real world it models diverge. And like I already said, that's where it gets interesting. That's not where models fail. This is where we can learn from models. Mm. And also maybe one important thing, just as a last note, uh, on digital standardized and formal models. So as you've seen Stachowiak's uh, series from 1973, it's long before the digital humanities. We say that the term digital humanities for our field has been used since 2004. Um, so he made this theory for models in general, for models in science, but it, it still applies. It's a, that's why it's a great theory, because it's very um, general. Mm, but an important distinction is that not all the models that he talks about are models that we talk about. Our models are just a subset of models. Our models have to be standardized as for us to um, be able to exchange data, uh, search and query data if we don't know what exactly it looks like or if the computer doesn't know then it cannot perform automatic uh, operations. So this is what we call a formal model. So a model that follows a stricter set of rules and thus all digital models are called formal models. So just so you know, you could draw a model on paper and that would not necessarily be computer processable. And I think as a um, summary we could say that Models are simplified representations of parts of the real world. So why am I telling you this? Why should we care about modeling theory? Modeling is a pivotal task in the humanities and the digital humanities especially, even so much so that some people argue that this is one of the defining criteria if we want to define our digital humanities a discipline. Um, people often mention modeling as a common criterion. Mm. And when we create digital representations of material objects, those are always models of the originals that only like, that have all the criteria of what a model is. They're abstractions, they're subjective. They don't cover all aspects of the original. So they are by definition subjective, abstracted and not universal, even though of course they try to generalize. And their quality has to be judged not by their completeness, but by their relation to their purpose. So does it fulfill its purpose? But there is another uh, important distinction mm, here, and that is that we can have different approaches to this. That is the research-driven one that I already mentioned. If I want to research a specific object, I would make a model as much more detailed, but that doesn't necessarily apply to other things as well. So it's individualized for answering a research question. It's work intensive and relatively expensive. So for example, if you were to create a digital edition, get a grant to do a digital edition project, that would be a very individualized model for your text. Whereas in curation-driven modeling, that would be more something like mass digitization, um, where we apply a cookie cutter approach, which covers the most important elements for most use cases, but it can easily miss features relevant to subject matter experts, which we all are. So I guess we all know um, many of the advantages of digitization, such as having um, things available, um, having them more discoverable. That's something that also Pia said. Often the experts only take out the same books, and then once they get digitized, suddenly uh, we realize what uh, books we even have. But then again, if they get digitized by a non-subject matter expert, the experts then might have to go back to the original even despite the object being digitized, because features were missed, for example. Mm, superficial digitization, or maybe superficial is a, not such a nice word for it, I guess just digitization that can't focus as much on the details of a specific original, uh, can lead to the creation of misleading data sets. They might have errors because people didn't have time, or they, people digitizing didn't have enough knowledge of the subject matter, to be able to tell that there was an error. Mm. Or for example, there could be bad tagging. And this is also where reparative librarianship can come in. And generally the need that data gets corrected. It gets created once, but it needs correction. So this modeling process 
in this case also, is never ending. It's like a hermeneutic circle. Mm. I'm going to give you an example of what I mean by that. Um, I have looked at the holdings of a, an unnamed library and I was looking for some of the alchemical things that I'm interested in. I was interested in so-called books of secrets, that's books which contain recipes. But actually this is not such a well-researched topic and it's kind of hard to tell which books even belong to this genre. There are a few publications on always the same author, but I wanted to do, um, I wanted to create a corpus of these things that's representative, that has enough data for me to do machine learning on. So I looked into the library catalog and I realized that they were a ton of different search terms, ton of different tags for these books. Some of them said in German secret, which is a different word from secret actually, it's a word potentially misleading. Some say Geheimmittel, some said pharmacological treaties, and so on. So it's really hard finding these books. Then these books had some, you know, that the short titles of early modern books are often mm, indicative of genres or of types of books. So some of them had pharmacopoeia, some of them had secrets in the titles, and then I looked in, and not all of them had recipes. Some just had the secret causes for, like, the explanations of why they think these ailments work. So in this case, I would have been glad if the catalogers had noted whether there are any actual recipes because I wanted to do recipe extraction. But when there's no recipe, I can't extract anything. Um, so this needed lots of manual work checking. Is, is this description correct, essentially? Or filling in the blanks that were left by this description, which obviously is not the fault of the institution because they probably didn't have the resources. This uh, subject is very under-researched, so nobody really knows these things very well. So I assume I have more knowledge of this than the people digitizing it, which is not a problem per se, but you can see how, yeah, how the advantages of research-driven digitization versus mass digitization. But both of them uh, have their purpose and both of them are important. Because, for example, like I said, objects become more discoverable. And because the models are reduced in a way, they become comparable. Like we've seen yesterday, the objects were very unique. But if I look at these general things and I try to fit them into this model, even though it doesn't fully fit, at least I can compare parts. And over a large corpus, that might still give us insights that we wouldn't have had, especially in the digital humanities where we can do machine learning or something like that. So these are the most important things about these two types of digitization. And I also wanted to quickly go into the word data. We've, we will be talking about data a lot. I've mentioned it before. Uh, and so data is the plural of Latin datum, which means given. And that is a huge problem because we are in the humanities and we probably already have an intuition that data are not necessarily given. Data are constructed or created. And there has been a discussion in the digital humanities whether we should actually call them capta instead of data. Obviously this didn't take because data is used in the world all the time. But it's a good point for us in the humanities. And most data, the so-called givens, are constructed by so-called phenomenotechnical devices. This is a theory by the historian of science Bachelard. And so what he means by that is that most science is being done by perceiving devices. So a sensor, for example, is a device that perceives things in a way. But what it perceives is very basic. For example, a temperature sensor can sense certain temperatures or it senses something and then it labels it or is told to label this as this is 24 degree because the sensor doesn't know what 24 degree means, for example. So this is all very, um, very much not as objective as you would think when you think about data often when we want to um, get more quantification, numeric things in the humanities, it's being done with this um, trope of making the humanities more objective, which obviously has the false assumption that, that the sciences are objective and that data are objective, which they are not. And I think this is, this is not a bad thing. This is a potential where we in the humanities can generate new knowledge and where we can contribute to all of this, obviously. But yeah. So essentially the devices that we saw yesterday, the digitization machines, they are also perceiving devices, phenomenotechnical devices that capture data. And we know that this data we can 
call it a model. It's not the same thing as the original, but we hope, for example, as PFE told us, mm, they try to optimize them in a way so that they fit the purposes of the researchers, but also of the institution storing the data, because obviously that's also one of the needs. It needs to be data that's not too big to be stored and long-term archived. And yeah, data always has to be interpreted. And also, by the way, quantification in the humanities, as you might know, is not new. There were quantitative approaches in the humanities long before computers, such as in stillometry or in economic history. So if you ever come across this trope, trope that um, quantification or counting is going to make the humanities more objective, you probably already know that that's not the case, but I just wanted to remind you. Mm. And also that Stachowiak's pragmatism criterion means that we selectively capture data that's most important to us and not all possible aspects. And thus, we can say as a summary, data resulting from cataloging and digitization contains interpretations and is thus per definitionem always subjective and also always incomplete. This means that we can maybe help with reparative librarianship, we can contribute our own um, knowledge. For example, the descriptions that we've created, if we think that they're good enough, we could contribute them somewhere and then try to make the data sets better. We also have to know that there are lots of data sets that, come, that were just digitized, that come from problematic times. So we've also talked about um, Western versus non-Western ideas. And so obviously, lots of the data we have come from older holdings that contain many problematic things essentially or that are not balanced, that don't represent all um, types of people equally, all types of um, mostly Western rich people. So essentially there's a lot of uh, room for improving things. But as long as we know that data is uh, incomplete, we know that we can contribute and we can do work to make it better. But it, obviously it would be a fallacy to think only because the data says that doesn't necessarily mean anything if it's not balanced data set, if it's not representative. Yeah, I think so. We can't go into more detail in this, but I just want to um, impart this on you and to remind you, data is not the original. Yes, so let's get to what we were, what we're actually doing today. That's dig digital scholarly editing. And um, so I want to tell you what is digital scholarly editing and how is it different from what we've been doing so far. So all the different subjects that we are covering in the school are interrelated, but they're all also very different in ways. And we would also have very different expertises and essentially even different people doing those things because they're so such specialized tasks. And the introductions that we can give you are only introductions essentially, but I'm trying to, I will try to give you uh, as much information that you need to get started yourselves and also show you how to get started. Mm. So in digital editions, I'm assuming that you are somewhat familiar of what an edition is in a more classical sense, a text edition. Um, normal editions tend to be exclusive to text. This is not the case in the digital humanities. Digital editions are discipline independent and not exclusive to text. We can have editions of objects as well. Mm. A criterion that distinguishes digital editions is that it overcomes the limitations of print. For example, financial or um, inter or multimediality. So essentially, when you print out a digital edition, you should have a significant loss of content and functionality. Because if you don't, then theorists of digital editing would say this is not actually a digital edition. So it has to follow a digital paradigm to be considered a digital edition. For example, like a printed edition would follow a print paradigm. What does it mean? For example, <coughs> uh, a printed edition uh, is oriented on the page, whereas on a computer I don't need to have a page. Um, like uh, we said in some other session, uh, we used to have scrolls, then all of a sudden the codex um, limited us to a page and now we're scrolling again because we're not limited that, to that anymore. So mm, in a way we could say that this, um, this is a break from the print paradigm. 
Um, the financial limitations, maybe, um, as you know, editions are very expensive, edition projects. And if you want to put in all the information that you've collected, that would make the resulting book much more expensive. So in a digital edition, you can really keep all the information you wanted to give or all the research that you did because it doesn't cost much extra. You can also have multimedia. I'm going to show you later a digital edition that contains music, for example. That's something that would not be possible in a normal edition. Mm, and like I already said, mm, a digitized edition is not a digital edition um, in terms of um, how we would define it in the digital humanities. So it's not about the storage medium. And just being on the internet doesn't make it a digital edition. So if you have a retro digitized edition that nothing else has been done with, we probably wouldn't accept this as a true digital edition. Mm. And like I already said, digital edition cannot be given in print without significant loss of content and functionality. Uh, what could that mean? In the digital edition, we have different views. Uh, we have interactivity, we have searchability. I think this is one of the big points that many humanities people always bring up. But I think that's just the, the smallest aspect. I think we can do so many more great things. I mean, I can retro-digitize something, then it's searchable. But a digital edition is so much more than that. We could, for example, have facsimiles uh, alongside a diplomatic transcription and also provide reading versions all in the same edition and you can toggle between them. Um, also, oftentimes, we will have all of them generated from the same source data. This is called the single source principle. And how does that happen? Um, via data transformations. This is because we store our data in XML, what we're going to learn, in a standard of the TI, um, the Tax Encoding Initiative, that we can use this as a single source to create different sorts of outputs. That's different outputs that can go on the web, but we could also create a print edition from the same data, which is great because then we save a lot of data in storage, which we've already heard about, long-term archiving. We need to have it in multiple servers. It gets bigger and bigger the longer we want to store it. This is why it's important to have a single source and be able to create uh, different representations from it dynamically. And how these data transformations work, this is another story. It's just so you've heard of the technologies, is, for example, XSLT, the extensible style sheet language that we can't learn in this short class. But if you want to do that yourselves, and we will see a few reasons why you might want to be able to do that yourselves later on, then uh, I encourage you to take a class on it. I think it's an important skill to learn in the digital humanities if you want to do digital editions. Mm, yeah, and so also a digital edition is not the same thing as a digital archive or a text corpus or a facsimile because it has critical engagement. So the things that come out of the digitization lab, essentially these are not digital editions. They are facsimiles. So you try to reproduce the visual aspects but no critical engagement has been done with it. So we would um, only consider something a critical digital edition if it has critical engagement. Mm. So um, I just want to remind you of what is a scholarly edition before we can define what are the defining criteria for a digital scholarly edition. So scholarly editions usually stem from, stem from ecdotics, so the tradition of philology, text work, and the goal is textual criticism. So we want to reconstruct uh, the original version of a text transmitted to us via textual witnesses. And this is called the Lachmannian paradigm, and the philologists among you probably are familiar with this. Mm. However, um, Saleh uh, in 2016 uh, gives us a slightly different uh, definition of what a scholarly edition is. That already includes the aspect that in the digital humanities we don't only focus on text. I'm going to read the German first because it's a little richer than um, the English translation. Edition ist die erschließende Wiedergabe historischer Dokumente. So in English, a scholarly edition is the critical representation of historic documents. And this is, seems like a very simple sentence, but it's actually very rich in meaning, which is why um, he goes on to explain in a lot of detail what he means and thereby define his concept of a scholarly edition. 
Mm. So the representation, he says it's a critical representation. What does representation mean? Representation mean recording a, means recording a document and its transformation in the same or other media. So that could be visually, by image um, re reproduction, a facsimile or something, textually, via a transcription. We're going to talk about transcriptions tomorrow. And it will have varying degrees of closeness or abstraction with regards to the original document. Representation is not the same thing as presentation. He makes a distinction uh, between those two words. Uh, the critical part is, means critical engagement and critical engagement based on a scholarly agenda. He says that critical engagement without representation is not an addition, but an examination, a catalog or a description. So for example, this is um, something we could apply to library catalogs. Why is a library catalog or a facsimile? For example, we could think that a facsimile with a detailed bibliographic description is some sort of an ed edition, but no, it's not an edition because there is no representation of the text. Mm. So we would want some sort of textual criticism, historical criticism, bibliographic criticism, material criticism, or visual criticism. And as you can see, these categories are, are always blending into each other. So we could have a kind of minimal digital edition that looks a lot like a data object. So it's blurry at the borders. What is a document? He defines that every non-abstract object that is the subject of an edition can be called a document. So that can be objects as well. And then historic um, editions explain what is not evident to the present day reader. In short, they bridge a distance in time, a historical difference. Texts that are created today do not need to be critically edited. They can speak for themselves. Although this is what Sale says, I think this last point is maybe the most problematic because you could argue that you can definitely create an edition of a modern text as well, depending on if it's very specific for a genre or a subject or something like that. So let me read you this next quote. A representation without critical treatment or the addition of information is not an addition, but a facsimile, a reproduction, or nowadays a digital archive or library. Critical representation as a compound notion of editing aims at the reconstruction and reproduction of texts and as such addresses their material and visual dimension as well as their abstract and intentional dimension. And we will see more what, I, what he means by these dimensions because Patrick Saale uh, has this important concept, that's the text wheel, where he distinguishes different aspects of what a text can be. We've also um, discussed that in the introduction already. So just uh, to sum this up, questions to ask yourself if you want to know is something a digital scholarly edition? In short, I mean, there are many more criteria that are being constantly developed and discussed, but these are the most important ones. Uh, is there a full representation of the subject in question? Is it critical? That means um, the processing rules are stated and applied. Scholarly knowledge is included to make the document easier to understand. Regarding material, document genesis, document creation, uh, context and reception. Is the edition of academic quality? So that would be a transparent and rigorous edition process. Responsibilities are stated. Um, it enables future research on a reliable basis. This is a very important criterion in digital scholarly editing. As you might know in the early days of the internet, uh, the internet was not a trustworthy source. So essentially the theory behind digital editions and the best practices have integrated mechanisms for um, creating authority in a way or making sure that uh, documents are of academic quality. That would be, mean that it's citable in a digital edition a project, lots of uh, people will be uh, involved. So you need to state responsibilities. This is also something we will see in practice, that these documents ask us to state responsibilities, who did what, because only then can you judge whether a document is of scholarly quality, essentially. It needs to be citable, otherwise uh, it's useless for long-term scholarly um, research. 
And the transparent and rigorous addition process means that the, um, for example, the rules stated ab above in the second point, I said that the processing rules are stated, they also need to be applied rigorously. So if you have transcription rules and you don't follow them, that would also not count, obviously. Mm, it can always happen and you probably all know that in practice errors are made, but just generally. And then the most important question to ask yourselves, uh, does the edition follow a digital paradigm? So it makes use of the possibilities of the digital that go beyond what would be possible in the non-digital and it's not printable without a major loss of content and functionality. So there's, as you've learned, there's more to know about digital editions and how you can tell if a resource is one than you might think uh, on the first look. And ideally, a digital scholarly edition should also implement the so-called FAIR criteria. These are also very important to know. I think most people have already heard about them nowadays because they've become uh, the basis of many uh, grant applications as well. And that would be findable. So your edition should be findable in library catalogs, discovery systems or repositories, and it should have a persistent identifier. It should be accessible. That means it's free for any user with no access restrictions. Um, so that goes from being open access also to usability things. For example, I know that often digital editions get made in German that are technically not accessible to an audience. So I think, for example, if you uh, publish in your own language that not everybody knows, you should have at least some introductory material in English so that people can at least know what the source is. Obviously, you're not expected to do everything in English, but just make it accessible. That could also mean being, for example, screen reader accessible, so accessibility in all sorts of levels. Mm. Interoperable, that's a very important uh, point that um, I think Sean will get into more um, in a later session. Um, so we want data to be in a standardized and widely used format. For example, the text encoding initiative, which is why we learned that, it's the gold standard for text editing. Mm. And it has to allow for reuse and data exchange outside of the project. This means the data needs to be available, because if it's not available or if I can't reach it, then I can't reuse it. But also the, the rights, the licenses need to allow me to freely reuse it. And uh, the data in a standardized format uh, allows me to understand somebody else's data without too much work. But as you will see, encoding something in the TI, even though there is a strict set of rules and there are many of them and many guidelines, it still contains subjective decisions. So that's why you need to document the decision you made because if you don't follow the rules as they were intended or at least in the very basic things, then these, your data will be not comparable to somebody else's data. But this is essentially what we want because if everybody uses the same standard, all of a sudden we can collaboratively create bigger corpora that allow us to examine bigger trends, for example. And reusable, I've also partially already covered that. The data has to be accessible, for example, as an individual download, an aggregate download, a repository, or an API. Mm. The licenses need to allow reuse. And the data creation, modeling, and processing is documented adequately so that others can make sense of it in the practical use. And this is actually lots of work because you need to document your data, you need to do your edition, and then you also need to cover all these other things. But if you want to make a good digital edition, this is what you would have to do. So there is the so-called Rede journal uh, that is being edited um, by the Institute for Documentology and, uh, it's Institute for Documentology and Editorik, where uh, our center is also very involved. And their journal is, essentially the review journal for the, this institute. That's why it's called RIDE. And it's a review journal for digital editions and other resources. That means they have developed a catalog for reviewing digital editions and resources. Uh, that will allow you to tell is something a digital edition, to describe it in all the relevant aspects. And I think looking into these things will help you a lot to understand how digital editing works, what best practices are. And so the journal produces article length reviews. So these are not reviews in one page, 
These are reviews that get very long, especially mine, uh, maybe longer than they should be. Um, but the point is also to discuss the state of the art of um, digital editing. And for example, if somebody invented a new concept in a digital edition, you would point it out. Or in the practical um, use, things become obvious that should be best practices and aren't yet. And so this is an important place where, um, where scholarly work on digital edition as a meta thing happens. Mm, so I've just listed a few things for further reading. The Patrick Saale article that I cited is really very good. I think it explains the theory behind digital editing, um, all you need to know in just one article. And it's called, What is a Scholarly Digital Edition? In the um, Digital Scholarly Editing Theories and Practices Edited Collection. And I think I wrote a summary blog post about it that you could also look into and it's what you really need to know about digital scholarly editing. So we don't have a lot of time to go into all the edition schools because I think as well, if you want to do a textual edition, you probably already know about it or you know where to find out about it. But for all those who don't, I just wanted to give a short overview and bring up a few more concepts before we get practical, finally. Mm. So we have been wondering what is a text, and I want to bring that up again with Patrick Sales' text wheel that I mentioned previously. This is it, what you're seeing now. Mm. And so he has different um, dimensions of what a text is. Let's begin with text S. Text S is the text as an idea as meaning, as semantics, sense, or content. So for example, you could think um, a literary work is just mainly defined by its content, if we care about the story, for example. The text W is the text as a work, as a rhetoric structure. Text L would be the text as a linguistic code, as a series of words, as speech. This is something that we often look at in the digital humanities when we do, for example, um, quantitative text analysis or something that would be called text mining or distant reading. Uh, we have to process text as a linguistic code, as words, and then try to get at more meaning from that. Or for example, obviously linguists would also look at text that way. Then there's text G, that is something that um, will be more relevant tomorrow morning, and uh, that is text as um, a version of or a set of graphs, graphemes, glyphs, characters, etc. So in the transcription module, that's obviously what we're looking at, text in its dimension as a glyph, in a way. The text D is text as a document, the physical uh, material individual document. That would be, for example, what we looked at yesterday, the materiality of the book. That's text in its dimension as a document. And then also there's text as a visual object uh, and a complex sign. That's also kind of related to the graphs and graphemes. But for example, you might want to think about uh, a poem that's arranged in the form of an image. You probably know some of those. And uh, that would be that. So I just want to briefly contrast what would be the workflow of a traditional philological editing versus digital editing, because digital editing works very differently in a practical way. So in the traditional workflow, you probably know it, there's heuristics, you find your textual witnesses, transcription, you transfer the text into your preferred alphabet uh, from the original or from a photo, you have the process of collation, where you compare textual witnesses. Then recensio, where you evaluate the variance and create a stemma to be a very traditional editing workflow. Then maybe you write your introduction, you typeset it, you create an index and refer to pages, and then you have print and distribution. In the digital realm, this is very, very different. So we have the editing process, and usually we start with a better version. Uh, and in case you didn't know um, why this is called a better version, the first version of something is a better version, because the idea is that the alpha version is the idea or the mock-up, and so the first functional version is the better version. 
then you could, for example, have just the TI data publication before you have it a usable edition. You might want to publish your data first. You could do a hybrid publication, so web and print from the same data using the single source principle, ideally. Uh, you could have a minimal edition, that is um, an adaptation for minimal computing. It's a fancy term in the digital humanities at the moment. And a digital edition is very much a social uh, process and an iterative process. So you have many people involved. In a critical edition or a traditional edition, it would be possible that one person does all of this alone. In the context of digital scholarly editing, usually you have a team of people with different expertises. It's much more collaborative and you will start putting it out into the world when it's not finished, which is, I think, scary for many people in the humanities, but it's also a great advantage because, I don't know, if you have these big edition projects and you remember them, the huge edition projects that wouldn't come out for 20, 30 years, in the context of a digital edition, I can put out what is already there and then I can always edit it. But that also means that the edition and the concept of the edition um, is different because now I have different versions. I need to think about things such as versioning. How do I cite different states of this document? So this idea that we often have about editions, I think we were trying to turn this concept on its head before that an edition in a modern book would be, we think about it as all of the copies are the same. In this case also, not even this one copy is the same or remains the same. It keeps changing. So there's multiple copies, if you want, multiple versions of the same document. Yeah, so we have talked about this before. What, what is an edition? It could be a particular version of a book, a particular version of a product, or all the copies of a book that were printed or published at one time. We have the concept of the historical critical edition. That would be the documentation of the history um, of text transmission uh, in the apparatus of variants and a critical evaluation of textual transmission. I've already mentioned the Lachmannian paradigm before that is named after Karl Lachmann, um, where you have the idea of editorial intervention. So you use your philological knowledge, like linguistics or style, to amend fragmentary textual transmission. And of course, there's the very problematic concept behind it, that you think there is one true original and that you want to recreate it. Maybe also related to this idea of what is the ideal copy that we've already seen doesn't necessarily exist. So we're not doing that anymore, but that's also why digital editing di diverges from these more traditional editions, because many traditional editions, even though maybe we don't adhere to the Lachmannian paradigm anymore with all of its aspects, the tradition is still highly influenced by it. Whereas in digital editing, I don't need to decide on one version. For example, this, this idea of the true text still lives on in the fact that a print edition, we need to decide on one version. We say what the differences are, but they are ranked by the fact that one of them is in the main text and the others are just notes. Whereas in a digital edition, I can have them all in parallel, which is a blessing and a curse at the same time because when you have lots of editions, sometimes people also want somebody to make a decision, which one should I read? Maybe provide a reading version. But yeah, these are some of the differences. And just, uh, I'll just name drop a few different editorial schools just to remind you of how many there are and how many different decisions can be made. So the Lachmannian school with the Historische Kritische Ausgabe, the historical critical edition, stematology and so on. We could have a reading text contrasted to the critical edition uh, that would be called the reader-oriented pragmatism or modernized edition or reading text edition. Uh, a last authorized edition with authors where we know that they, um, during their lifetime, there were multiple editions. You could think, for example, uh, in the case of Goethe's Faust, it's a big decision. Do, do you, we look at the original, the first most pure version, or the final last authorized version? As far as I know, lots of people think the last one isn't the best necessarily, because maybe he was getting old and so on, but this is um, a choice that you can make. The opposite idea of that is the first edition, the Editio Printkebst, which is 
uh, related to this ideal copy very much. The main manuscript, the light handschrift, a diplomatic edition, transcription, hyper diplomatic editions and transcriptions. We can have the typographic or photographic facsimile, documentary editing, the variorum edition, genetic edition from the critique genetique, copy text theory, and new philology, just to name a few. And as you can see, it's, it's a lot of them. So I'm just saying, if you wanted to practice um, and sharpen your mind as to what is a critical edition, what is a digital scholarly edition, you could practice also in a way that might be relevant for you as scholars, because we know we always need to publish. Uh, this uh, Riede journal has um, suggestions for a review. So people can suggest projects that should be reviewed. They can suggest their own projects. So if there's a project in your subject area, this might be a great way of looking at it with your skills that you already have from your subject area and then brush up on your digital editing skills because they offer these reviewing criteria. So you can just go through them one by one. And yeah, so if you actually plan on submitting, obviously contact the editors first to make sure that your edition isn't already being done and that they approve you as an editor. But it's fine to say that you don't have previous experience in digital scholarly editing, especially if you have a strong background in the subject matter. Uh, it's 2,000 words minimum and I think you can go up to 20 pages because I did not get killed for submitting 20 pages. But I think maybe, maybe don't do that. <laughs> and pick a project from your field. And, and the good thing is because these reviews are peer-reviewed publications, peer review can help you spot things that you missed. So you don't need to be afraid uh, to make mistakes, essentially. And um, get a publication while learning about this and maybe getting a foot in the door in the digital scholarly editing community, if that's what you want. Yeah, sorry, there's lots of theory um, in this session. We will get to the practice soon and we will have a break soon as well. But I think this theory is important to help us tie in all the different sessions into what we're doing now, because otherwise it would just be Here's a TI introduction, and what does it have to do with anything? And yeah, so here we are. Uh, short input on digital archives. I promise it's not too much. Mm, we have heard about digital long-term archiving. I think it's probably also a good reminder. Uh, the goal of long-term archiving is to ensure the authentic and sustainable availability of digital resources on the level of the bitstream and on a semantic level. It's an integral principle to every form of sustainable data storage. It begins with the data production in a sustainable data format and ideally following a recognized data standard. So this is why even if you are not a long-term archiving professional and you're not planning to get into that, you as a producer are also responsible that your data is, can be long-term archived and is hopefully ideal to be long-term archived. And this begins with the cho choice of the data format, which is why you will be learning about TI. Mm, Long-term archiving requires a standardization of data formats and of archiving workflows. It serves both the dissemination as well as the preservation of digital content. So it's not just about um, technical solutions, but also about institutional stability and policies. So I don't know if you've heard about GitHub, if you work in the digital realm, you probably have. And um, lots of people have used this as a way to publish open access, which is good. But GitHub is a commercial outlet. They could take away your data at any time. So it's good, it's, it's free for the moment. But if you really want to have sustainable long-term archiving, it would be better if you had your data archived with an institution that guarantees for the sustainability. So we say that long-term archiving begins at 10 plus years. That is a long time in the digital world. And as we've heard, many projects are basically dead after they're finished. Because oftentimes, for example, the project runs or until the end of its funding period. You barely scramble to finish everything. And then, especially with digital projects, sadly, things start um, breaking and you don't have any money anymore to get it fixed. And I mean, 
functionality breaking is um, is a big issue, but even just archiving it when there is no more ongoing funding. So you essentially need an institution behind you, ideally maybe state-run institution, that will guarantee that they will support it in the long term. And so there, uh, there is a set of trust seals or trustworthiness criteria. For example, the GATS um, uh, repository GAMS, we are certified and we need to fulfill a set of criteria to remain certified as a, a long-term archiving repository. And this is something that you should be looking for. If you want to publish a digital edition, you should find an institution that will host it, ideally. Obviously, if you're an individual researcher, that might not be possible. If you're just doing your PhD project and you don't have any funding, then, of course, GitHub is fine. It's better than not um, making these things public at all. But just so you know what the ideal workflow would be. Mm, yeah. So a digital archive is more than a mere collection of scanned book pages or digitized images. So we've already heard the same thing uh, with the digital edition. It's more than just scanned pages. But a digital archive as well is more than just scanned pages. Because, for example, it offers metadata. It might make use of norm data or controlled vocabularies. I will show you an example of the, one of the books that we saw, the Toya Dank, and the uh, University of Graz library um, catalog entry for it. And that also at the bottom, which is not going to be in my slide, but at the bottom, it also links to the Gemeinsame Normdatei, the GND. That's a German um, language bibliographical, biographical uh, database where you can link to individuals and it would link to the individuals that were involved in the creation of this book. So even though uh, the library has a different system than we do and a different publication server, they also adhere to these same standards essentially. They just have a different way of applying them. So just briefly, a digital archive is an organized collection of digital objects, texts, images, audio, oh. video, and multimedia streams. Digital objects are described by standards, both in terms of contents, so for example, using the TI, and bibliographically using the Dublin Core. The Dublin Core are the most important bibliographical um, informations that you need for a digital data set. And those are different from the ones from the original represented source. This is something we will get into later. If you create a digital representation of something, you need to describe both the source and the digital file. So you have essentially two bibliographic records in one. Um, yeah. So these digital objects are published sustainably using interfaces, services, and API. The digital objects have unique persistent and citable identifiers, just DOI, URN, Perl, PID number. Mm. The authenticity of the objects is checked by means of digital signatures or checksums. That means asking, is the number of bytes in this object still the same as it used to be? And checksums are essentially algorithms that will show a big difference in the checksum if only a small bit of the file was corrupted. And so this is a way that you can automatically check, are my files going bad? And so ideally you have them multiple times, so one of them is still correct. And the longer you archive it, essentially the more copies of it you need because some of them might break. Mm, the digital archive will be retro-digitizing retro objects, but it will also have standards for born digital resources. And I've just listed you a summary of criteria for trustworthy archives, so that's for example, the organizational structure and legal status, like I just mentioned, financial sustainability, technological and procedural aptness, ensuring the data security. These are some of the aspects you, it's, that are very easy to forget, but obviously you theoretically would also have to take that into account. These um, archives should be documented and transparent and conform with the OIAIS standard. So, I'm not going to go through this whole slide, I just put it here in case you were wondering what is the difference between a digital edition and an archive. Uh, so this is a resource that you can look at in the slides later. Um, essentially the difference between a digital edition and an archive is blurry in the digital realm, 
but it's in the amount of critical engagement. So a digital archive will just mostly host data, but it will not have so much critical engagement with them. It will have metadata, so that is a form of critical engagement, so that's how it gets blurry, but it will not have as much. Yeah, so if you want to know about that, that's why there's such a lot of stuff on the slide. We're almost getting to the practical. This is the library catalog data example that I promised you. And so this is just a screenshot of the Toya Dunk, uh, one of the books that we saw yesterday. And so you can see what type of data would be in this library catalog. So it is fully digitized, so it has all the image reproduction. And it, has, it shows us bibliographic metadata such as title, author, participants. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the participants have this yellow line, it means that's a link in our system, and it has the G and the W, which the G stands for the Gemeinsame Normdatei, G and D. That's this biographical um, norm data, and Wikipedia. So it links um, to show basically uh, a persistent, unique identifier for this person. It has a description that doesn't have a lot of detail in this case. Um, there's an annotation that says it's in Fraktur. Mm, there's a bibliographical reference, the keywords, and the URN, and the VD16 number. So VD16, there's also a VD17. That's the Verzeichnis, uh, the Drucke aus dem deutschen Sprachraum des 16. Jahrhunderts. So the, um, it's an overview catalog of prints which appeared in the German-speaking area in the 16th century. Uh, VD17 is for the 17th century. And so it essentially tries to show which unique copies are there. So different libraries digitize their collections, they write bibliographical records, and then they show some examples or digitize some examples of where the copies diverge. So this is how we could do research, for example, uh, on the unicality of um, a book or how they diverge. Yeah, so, and then they offer a PDF for download, a reference in the library catalog. They have METS data, that's also important in uh, metadata standard for the digital humanities, but we won't go into that, and a IIIF manifest that um, Sean will go into in his presentation. And for those of you who know Mark, I won't go into detail here, but I just want to show you, this is a Library of Congress Mark XML for the Toya Dank. So it's obviously a different book than ours, but this was a data that I was able to find. And it's very much simplified here for demonstration purposes because it's very long, it doesn't fit onto a slide. But I just put a short example. It's essentially a pretty simple XML standard that implements uh, the library cataloging standard Mark. So just a few things, for example, here it says the shelf mark, and here it says original source extent. And then th it has this um, data field that has a description about the book, which I put on the slides uh, in case you needed maybe to write a TI header for it later if you wanted to use this example. 